All right, welcome. Uh, quick survey for how many people is this your first time coming to a DFW Data Viz event? Look at that, more than half. Fantastic. Thank you for coming out. Um, if you're not already a member, uh, if you go to bit.ly DFW Data Viz, you can sign up um, and you'll get emails every time we schedule a new talk. We try to do one a month is our goal. Um, and we'll cover everything from like tonight's Tableau to graphic recording like John's doing over there. We'll talk about that in a second. To the online promotion of infographics and designing good charts. Um, and all the way down to like programming in D3 and R and stuff like that if that's the kind of thing you guys want to get into. Um, so anyway, if you want to get on the Wi-Fi, there is Wi-Fi here. If you have to get on to SMU Guest, register, and it'll turn around and email you a temporary password. It's kind of complicated. Um, but that's their guest network here at SMU. What do we got? Um, my name's Randy Crum. So I run the website Cool Infographics. My book is called Cool Infographics. And if you're interested, you, I've got a couple copies you're welcome to browse through. Um, but on my website at coolinfographics.com slash book, you can download the first chapter as a PDF for free. So you can just check it out. Um, and, but like I said, I've got a couple copies if you want to page through the whole thing. I do have a LinkedIn discussion group. We have about, uh, I think, 1,500 members on LinkedIn. And the idea is people actually practicing the art of visualizing data <coughs> or designing charts and reports or publishing and promoting infographics. Um, I try to moderate out stuff when people just come and say, hey, check out my infographic because they're looking for links. Um, I try to get that out of there and make sure it's a discussion about data viz and infographics. So you're all welcome um, to join the group. It's open. Tonight's sponsors, InfoNude is my design company. We design data visualizations uh, for companies all over the world, whether it's presentations or infographics or charts. Uh, about half of what we do are the online promotional infographics, and then the other half are um, corporate, under NDA, internal data used for internal communications. Um, and SMU continues fabulously to give us locations like this um, for free so that we can keep the whole meetup group for free. Um, the goals for everybody who is near new, like I said, we meet monthly. We're trying to give everybody an opportunity for local networking, to see some tools they've never seen before, to meet speakers like Dan tonight, um, but also to you know find other companies, find other people in the business here in the DFW area. We're a pretty big group. Um, this week, the Data Viz group crossed 1,000 people. So there are now over 1,000 people registered in the Data Viz group, so that's fantastic. I will stop and open it up for a moment if anybody has open positions at your company that you'd like to share with the group. Anybody want to share that you've got open positions, you're looking for data analysts or data visualizers or designers or anybody? Crickets. Yeah. Nobody's hiring. Okay. <laughs> anybody looking for a job even though nobody's hiring? <laughs> you're welcome to stand up if you want to say what you do and what you're looking for. No. No. Okay. <laughs> Come on. Okay. My name is Dal Janis. I'm a business analyst, senior technical person, SQL expert. Complex things told simply. Uh, if you're interested in, I'm one of those strange people who can actually take what marketing said and explain to the text what they meant. <laughs> take the C level and explain them to auditing and vice versa. And so I, I can actually speak a whole lot of languages that all appear very similar to English. <laughs> so that's Thank you. Anybody else? else? Go ahead. Hi, I'm Larry Stein. Um, I do analytics and visualization for my day job. At night, I'm an umpire. Um, yeah, I, I, I call it the Little League World Series. Um, <laughs> I'm marrying the two, as strange as that sounds. Applying data to all these nonprofits, there are thousands of leagues across the world, and it's amazing how much data they have, but I need assistance, and I'm specifically looking for assistance with Tableau and mapping. So, if anybody that interests you, it's a nonprofit, not anything. But yeah. And it was Larry, right? Yes. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Um, I am filming. I've been trying to film off and on our events, so we do have a, 
a, a list, a playlist on YouTube where you can see a handful of our past events, especially for all of you, this is your first time, you can go check out some of the speakers uh, you've missed in the past. I think I've got five or six of them up. Um, we'll post this one up, but it's just me, so it might be a couple weeks, might be a couple months before it hits up. Um, I still have a couple that I haven't posted yet. Um, thank you to SMU. If you're interested, there's a sheet on all the tables about some of the spring courses that still haven't started and are open for registration. Um, for part of the meetup group, if you use this discount code, MU316, I don't know the exact amount because it's different per class, but it gets you a discount off of every class that um, SMU is offering. And I know, Bruce, for you. You want to stand up and talk about your class real quick because I know it's coming up soon. Yes, I'm Bruce Moore. I will be teaching a class in R, an introduction to R for data analytics. I'll really be talking about three major things. First, how to bring data into R from all of the different strange, unusual data sources that you're likely to encounter. How to do 2D visualizations and also how to do some interactive visualizations that you can use on the web. It's going to be about six sessions and I think uh, it'll be a fun time. When does it start? It starts on May 17th. I was thinking that that was a Tuesday. Okay, don't look at this. <laughs> this is, these, some of these classes like mine are already halfway through, so just look at the code. The discount code is all that counts. It is Tuesday. And how much? How much is your class, Bruce? Do you know? That's actually a good question. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Leah. <laughs> Oh, did it say on the sheet? Four ninety-five. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> I, I do have a discount code. That, uh, or two hundred cash. To we'll give you exactly. <laughs> cash in advance. Unofficial, right? <laughs> That's right. Right now, yeah. Um, oh, last thing about SMU. Uh, Leah was handing out surveys. They're looking for new topics that you guys want to see SMU offer as classes. If you would either. Drop those off up front or drop them off at the table on your way out. Um, we will gather all those together um, and make sure she gets away with them at the end of the night. Uh, upcoming events. We have a lot of stuff going on in the DFW area, so I'd like to open it up um, to a few events. I know the Rocks Digital Conference is coming up at the end of June. Um, if you want to use our discount code, they use my name. So the discount code is Randy Crum. We'll get you $25 off the Digital Marketing Conference here in Addison. Um, and so that's the end of June through the 1st of July. Um, and you can find that at rocksdigital.com. Steve. <laughs> Randy. Hey, so thank you for putting this up. Um, so I'm Steve Koch. I'm with Expose UX. If you haven't heard of Expose UX, it's a TV series where startups compete for, uh, for prizes, essentially. And they go in front of a panel of, uh, of judges who are UX experts. And uh, whoever wins gets, you know, uh, a ton of different prizes, including uh, assistance from those experts. And so next Thursday on the 12th, we're having our, um, it's kind of a combined event. So it's uh, our My UX Story event, uh, where these panelists, so some of them you may even know, like Steven Anderson, Trey Bowles, so Gun Sign, and startup experts, um, will be talking and sharing their UX stories. So basically when they realize that UX was important, which we all know, it obviously is very, very important, but you know, at some point in time it kind of hit that. So we'll be doing that, and then we'll also be launching our Kickstarter for our 25 city tour. So we premiered back in December, and uh, starting in June, we'll be going on tour, um, a multinational tour. So we're actually hitting Canada as well. So um, if you want to check that out, uh, just go to exposeux.com slash ks, which will it up, or you can go to exposeux.com slash kickstarter. It's free. Um, there is limited space, and we're about three quarters full right now. So if you want to go, please sign up soon. Is the sign up? Is it a meetup thing, or is it a uh, so yeah, event right thing, or what is it's it? an event right thing. Okay. Yep. 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 So, um, so the exposeux.com slash ks will take you to the Facebook group, yep. and then you can you can either join there or you can go to event right. So. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Appreciate everyone. It. Um, before I go to that, anybody else know of any events you guys are going to or you want to share with the group? Anything coming up in the data viz, data analytics world in the next, say, three or four weeks? 
Just us. Okay. Um, I am always looking for future topics and future speakers as much as possible in the local area because we don't have any funding to fly people in. Uh, we are trying to find some sponsorships so that we can fly some authors in and some experts in because we would love to. Um, but so far we're looking for either if you know a topic you want to go after and we can try and find a speaker or if somebody at your company would be a good speaker, send me a note, grab one of my business cards tonight um, and help us just sort of schedule out our monthly events. We're always looking, like I said, we're going to meet monthly and we're looking for speakers indefinitely. All right, so let me do a couple intros, then we'll do the ebook drawing. So first, we have John. Oops, I'm too fast. So John, Coralatola, is that right? Is that close? Oh. <laughs> I can never get that quite right. Um, it's going to be graphically recording tonight's talk. So that's what this big white piece of paper over here is going to be. Um, and so he's going to try to take visual notes of the whole night. John works for Collective Next. You want to say a few words about what Collective Next does? Sure. Uh, we, in a big picture, we help facilitate change at organizations. So we design uh, uh, strategy and change workshops, and we facilitate collaborative learning for all kinds of large organizations. We also do work with nonprofits and cities and governments. Um, and a, a strong element of a lot of those workshops is what we call scribing or graphic facilitation. And those those aspects can be lifted and brought to things like this, where there's somebody talking or uh, giving a presentation, and we can capture that visually. So that is something that I did a couple months ago. Yeah, this uh, was Cole's talk. So those of you who were that were at Cole's uh, storytelling talk, I was there, and that was the hours worth of capture on a whiteboard. Um, no whiteboard tonight, so we're going to use paper. Um, can't make a mistake. Uh, so that's, that's what do. If you want to know more about beyond describing, like the facilitation that we do, just come talk to me. Tell you about it. So John's going to be doing his thing all evening over there, and at the end of the night, I highly recommend you go over and take a look at what he put together. We'll take a like this one. We'll try to get some nice high-res photos of it and put it up on Meetup as well, um, so we can share that. And you can see what kind of notes uh, we put together. So Dan, you're up. If I can get this to come up. <clears throat> Tableau Zen Master, Dan, now working for Innerworks, right? Yes. Been working for Innerworks. Oh, long time. Long time. I'll let you sort of explain what you, okay. what you do. So all these connecting, um, let's do the quick drawing. Did everybody get a business card in here that wanted to? AT, one more. One in the back. Throw it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Go. One more. Anybody else? Last chance. It just works. What? It, it just works. works. Like that. All right. I've got uh, Murthy Manikin. There you go. So you get a free ebook from O'Reilly if you just go to this page. It'll let you download any of these data viz um, books for free. An ebook. Congratulations. And then I believe the iPad out of the way turn around. Okay. Well, first off, thank you for allowing me to speak here. It's a privilege to have an artist in the corner documenting me. It's actually unnerving. <laughs> now I want to be perfect in my delivery so that uh, you know it's easier to do what John's doing over there. Um, I'll, I'll give you the one minute on Interworks. We're, we're a technical consultancy that does a lot of data visualization work, but we also do pretty much every stage of bringing people from nothing in data all the way to an end, uh, which we call data vision, where you're using data to make decisions for, for as much of your business as you desire to do so. And um, I'll have a slide at the end where it explains some of those stages a little bit more. Uh, the talk today is called Predictive Analytics and Discovery with Tableau. I'm going to spend about 10 or 15 minutes talking about a little history. And I have a couple of questions. First, how many of you consider yourself to be Tableau Zen Master experts that are going to be correcting me in your mind when I go through this talk? Yeah, I know that guy. How many of you consider yourselves neophytes with Tableau? You just started using it 
and you're not totally familiar with it. What about a stage before that? Okay, and, and it looks like the majority of the people are new, so everything here will be new to you. <laughs> but it's all accessible things that you can master fairly quickly. Uh, so don't feel like uh, what I'm doing is something you can't learn to do within a few days. Uh, and hopefully um, you will think about getting a book to help you along this journey. Uh, I am going to give away a, a couple of books, but I don't carry them with me because the book is 700 pages and it gave me a really bad backache after the first week. So if you tweet out something with that hashtag, uh, you'll go in a drawing and we'll draw some names and give away a couple of books. All right, so. This is what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of the data landscape because when I got out of school in 1981, there wasn't much of a landscape. Uh, and now, of course, you look every week and there seems to be another database invented that has some use that is kind of difficult to determine. But I'll, I'll start with some discussion about a little bit of history and how I think about data and then the last part of the talk and the majority of the talk will be me demonstrating technique. I'm going to do some live downloads from the internet of data that's useful but not very well formatted. I'm going to fix it in Tableau and build a visualization, bridge a couple data sources. I'll show you forecasting, how to do discovery, some samples of that, and then uh, I'll put up a dashboard and explain how you make dashboards uh, discoverable for end users how you make them scale, how you make them understandable for people that don't know anything about what you're showing them. And then uh, the last example will be how do you leverage some open source tools and the cloud with Tableau to operationalize more complex statistical forecasts than Tableau can do. Uh, so that's what we're going to do today. Uh, the first question I'm going to ask though is how many of you are statisticians in the room? No one. So I feel very confident now. <laughs> I, can, I can comment on p-value and no one will correct me. Uh, the reason I ask that question is that there's a, a guy named John Tukey that worked at Stanford and Bell Labs in the, in the last century. And most of the really useful statistics that uh, people are using today, Tukey had something to do with inventing those statistics. And, the other interesting thing about Tukey is I think he actually visualized statistics in his mind. And I think I've, uh, the very first data visualization done on a computer was done by Tukey and a team at, the Stan at Stanford. And you can Google it. it. It's actually, if you go out on the web and Google Prim9 computer, this is the first guy you'll see. I don't know who that was, some professor, definitely 70s looking. Tukey's the guy on the right, and there's a, this video is John Tukey talking about a scatter plot on a computer, and this is 1971. And I asked Pat Hanrahan at Tableau, and Pat's one of the inventors of Tableau, if Tukey is someone that he had inspired him or he'd known of some of his work in this regard, and he actually got his undergrad or his master's degree at the University of Wisconsin, and Tukey came and gave a speech there when he was getting that degree. And he said it absolutely affected my decision to get into to data visualization. It was inspiring. And so I thought that was interesting. And when you look at some of the history of databases, you can pretty much draw a hundred mile radius around Palo Alto and mostly all the origins of SQL and a lot of different variants of SQL came from there. So I just think it's interesting that in such a small part of the world, you had enough people collectively together at the right moment that not only were databases being invented that we're using every day now, but data visualization started. And that on that computer screen was a scatter plot. And you can watch the video. By the way, all of the slides that I'm going to show you and all the examples will be out on the web in a couple of days. You'll be able to download this and look at it. So the other part of the landscape that I think is interesting is just this. The, what you're looking at are the number of businesses in the United States, right? And 
the Fortune 1000 is 1000, right? And they're the ones that had the money 20 years ago to buy really expensive uh, tools to do data analysis. But the, the thing that is interesting to me is that the vast majority of companies in the U.S. have 10 or fewer employees. And I spent a good part of my career in a company that had about 500 employees. And most of those companies don't have database departments. They don't have databases. They don't have a lot of expertise in doing data you know, analysis. And this is what I think Tableau is going to enable in the next five to 10 years. You're going to have a much wider number of companies doing um, data analysis in a more sophisticated way, but with tools that are much easier to use. And so, you know, when I started thinking about getting into consulting, I thought that the big market right away was going to be the really under 500 person company. And I, and I was really badly mistaken. I didn't realize how awful the acceptance was in large companies of traditional stack tools. The penetration was actually very low, and uh, the, the practice took off in a way that I didn't expect. It was very big companies that already had large investments in uh, BI stacks. But Tableau enabled more people to use it, made it more accessible, made it easier to bridge multiple different databases. And so, let me jump out and take a look at something here for a moment. How many databases? SQL, let's say SQL compliant databases, do you think there were in 1980? It's a trick question because SQL hadn't really been invented yet. <laughs> Ed Codd was, you know, had figured out the math and, and he was, you know, structurally figured out how the thing looked, but IBM hadn't invented it yet. And it didn't really get commercialized till the mid to late 80s. And what you're looking at here is um, a viz that basically was scalped off the web. Somebody on GitHub, or actually a consulting company in Germany, is monitoring the social feed on databases. And so what you're looking at is a list of all the different databases that have been mentioned in some way in social media. And on the left side here are all the different categories of databases that exist today. And you can see that the relational model is still by far the most popular, at least in terms of social. Uh, and you'll notice that Oracle is still up there at the top, and MySQL and SQL Server, the ones that you'd expect to see there, are there. But if I don't filter it for the relational model, how many of you are using MongoDB? Anyone? One person halfway raised their hand, another one tentatively. And I, if I was in San Francisco and asked that question, about three quarters of the room would raise their hand because it was invented by people there. But I've given talks all over the country and that's the typical response. That this is so new that most companies haven't sorted out how to use them yet. And if I go down this list and start clicking on the different options, you know, search engines, how many are using, how many of you used Elasticsearch today? One, two, three. Actually, if, do you have a cell phone? If you've got a cell phone and you search for something, you were probably running an elastic search uh, query somewhere. Uh, how about, well, we talked about Mongo. We had two people. Anybody using Redis? How about Neo4j? There's a lot of logistics companies in Dallas. No one? So if I keep going down this list, they're going to get more and more unknown to you. Uh, but the point is, right now, this is as of this month, there were 305 discrete databases mentioned in some way. And I'm sure there's more than that. But this is shocking. When I first saw this, I remember being at a job not deli delivering pizza in 1982. Because that was the first job I got um, when I got out of school school and there were no commercially available databases that weren't completely proprietary to be used with usually one transaction system and uh, it was very hard to get data out of one thing into another and, and there's an interesting thing that Tukey did uh, in 1961 he described himself as a data analyst not a statistician 
because he said, I spend about 2% of my time doing statistics and the other 98% of my time is collecting data, structuring the data, figuring out how to get the data to do what I want it to do, and then figuring out how to present it to people that aren't statisticians in a way that would be understandable. And he, he gave a speech on this at a big statistics conference in 1961 that was pretty controversial. He got up in front of a bunch of statisticians and told them he didn't think statistics were very important, that all these other things were more important. And I think that was very um, prescient for what we're seeing today. Because the biggest complaint I hear from every single client I have is that the Tableau is so fun, but it takes so long to get the data clean and structured and in a database that does what I want it to do. And so the challenges are the same. It's just the tools have gotten better and we have more of them. Let me get back to where I, I was. Now the other thing that, um, at least the way I think of this is, every company has three kinds of data. Um, everybody has known data, which is the reporting context that, you know, every day, every week, every month you have reports. And it's usually what causes discussion, all right? But there's no answers typically in a report. The second kind of data is the data that you know you need to know more about. Right? Because something's wrong with the report and some boss asks why. And so traditional tools did a pretty good job with these first two things because the, the questions were sort of bounded by what they saw in a report. But there's a third kind of data that is this. It's the data that you didn't know you needed to know more about. And it comes from interacting with data in sort of a non-judgmental way. You know, I, I, the typical way I saw data used the first 15 or 20 years that I was out of school was that somebody had an agenda and went and looked for data to validate their point of view. And that's all they did, which is not really the job of an analyst, right? It's to ask questions of data and then try to disprove the theory, sort of like a scientist. But uh, everywhere I go, I see these three kinds of data, and most people don't know about the third one because they don't think of it that way. The other, the other question I'm asked a lot by uh, BI people in particular is, why do I need Tableau? I already have every legacy BI tool invented. What is special about um, Tableau? And the way I describe it, because it's usually a C-level executive that doesn't know anything about databases is this. Legacy BI is kind of like a railroad track, right? It's definitely when I'm in Manhattan, the most efficient way to get anywhere is on the subway. The problem with the, the subway is that if there's a fire five blocks away, I can't go to the conductor and say, could you just pull over there? I'd like to look. And so the other qualities I think that a, a railroad makes a good metaphor for describing this is that it takes a long time to build the railroad. A lot of people argue about what the railroad should look like and how it should be built, and it's really, really expensive. But after the three to five years that you take to build it, it's done and it works. Tableau is more like the traffic copter, so if the fire's you know, burning a few blocks away, the copter can fly over there, get, get the uh, feedback and bring it back so that everybody knows what's going on. It's lightweight, it's a lot less money than the railroad, uh, and it's, it's fast, but in a different way. It's six years ago, seven years ago with Tableau, I said the railroad will always beat the helicopter in a straight line race to a known destination because it already knows the questions that you're going to ask. Whereas everything in Tableau is going on in memory, live, right now, and the time difference between the two used to be pretty substantial. But every year since then, the difference has been shrinking. So it's less true now that the Tableau is only good for this ad hoc discovery because a lot of people are using it as a reporting tool and an analysis tool. But the point I'm trying to make here is that it complements the railroad really well. Because it does something the railroad can't do and it makes it uh, 
uh, accessible to people that maybe don't work in IT that are under a different time pressure. So when your boss asks you for something and you're an analyst and expects it the next morning, it's just not acceptable for it to be six months. And that's, that's, the, that's the need it's plugging. So I'm going to talk first about something called the data interpreter. How many of you have used the data interpreter in Tableau since you're new? Well, that's actually pretty impressive, two people. Um, I decided this is something that needed to be talked about because no one's using it. Uh, I, every talk I've given in the last year, about two to three people in the room raise their hands. And I've actually asked a lot of Zen masters if they were using it, and they aren't. And when I ask why, it's, oh, well, it's not cool. It only really works with spreadsheets. And I remember seven years ago when I started doing consulting work in Tableau, uh, people would say, oh, Tableau's fun, but it's just a charting tool. It's not cool. It can't do this. It can't do that. So keep in mind that while the data interpreter now only works with spreadsheets, this is now, and a few years from now, it's going to do more things. So let's go. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do first is actually go through a live build of a real-world example. And, and where this example came from was at a show. About a year ago, we were, had a booth in San Jose next to the Census Bureau. And uh, I have used Census Bureau data for a long time because it's good data, but it's frustratingly annoying to download anything from the Census Bureau because it's never in a format that is the way you want it. And I said, I'm going to do a presentation tomorrow. Could you come to our booth and watch it? Because I want you to see what we have to do to use your data. And that's, that was the genesis of this particular example, um, which hopefully I've refined a little bit. So I'm going to open up Tableau. And I'm going to be using Superstore because everybody's familiar with it. But for example, let's say I'm an analyst and uh, I'm going to do some sales analysis since this is Superstore. One thing I might want to look at is sales by state. And that's easy to do, but it's also not very insightful because, of course, California is going to have the most sales because there's more people in California than there are in, let's look down at the bottom of the list, Delaware. Uh, so, right off the bat, I'm saying, well, how, how can I make this more useful? And one way to do that would be to normalize it for population. The problem is I don't have population data in my database. So, what I'm going to do is go out to the Census Bureau, who does have population data. And I found this particular data set right here that meets the time frame that I want to look at, it's also at the proper level of detail and that it's state data. So I'm going to click this and download it. And it'll take a second or two. And let's, let's take a look at the spreadsheet to see what it looks like. Let me increase the size of the font here a little bit. All right, so right off the bat, if you've used Tableau at all, those merged columns at the top, Tableau isn't going to deal well with because it doesn't know which one of the specific columns or which groupings of columns that that particular merge column belongs to. So that's a problem. The first, first two rows there, two and three. Uh, and then in column A, you see geographic area. This is sort of database rule 101. You know, have one field mean one thing, not three different things like it does here. We have the United States, we have regions, and we have states. And then just for fun, if I click on the state, there's that really annoying period that's been inserted in front of the word. Um, and that was either somebody that was really smart or didn't care. I, I'm not sure which, but Tableau doesn't understand what period California is. It understands what California is. So that, that's a problem. And if I scroll down a little farther, all right, I really don't care about Puerto Rico for my analysis because we don't have any business there, and that gap is going to be an issue and all this text. So those are problems that have to get fixed. And then if I look at the columns here, these first three columns of data I don't need. They fall outside of the range of my dates. So I need to get rid of those. They're just extra noise. And so what I'm really interested in is just 2011 through 2015. That's all I want. Now, 
I could fix this in the spreadsheet. I could take 20 or 30 minutes and clean it up, but that's annoying, right? So what I'm going to do with the data interpreter is fix all those problems without leaving Tableau. So the, the use case here is blend data in from another data source with my data, fix the structural problems, do what's called a data blend, and then I'm going to do calculations across those data sets. So let's do that. Um, first off, this is the data I just downloaded. I'm just going to pick it up and drop it in the view. And what Tableau did was say, oh, it's a spreadsheet. And now I'm going to connect to that data by just dragging the single tab in the spreadsheet into the drag sheets here area. And at the bottom half of the screen, you can see that Tableau is having some problems. You've got nulls because it doesn't know how to deal with those merged columns. But this little button right here, this turn on button, that will turn on the data interpreter. And when you do that, it's dealt with the merged column problem. So now I have a nice unbroken table, which is desirable. Now the next issue here is this geographic area problem. And I have to admit, sometimes it's better to be lucky than smart, because if I do one thing here, I'm going to fix two problems. The, the multiple types of data uh, geographic aggregations, and I'll also deal with the period. Tableau has this nice little facility called Split. It's going to look at that period as a delimiter. And when I click split, it added a new column that doesn't include anything for these because they didn't have a period in front of them. So it's empty now. And what's left here is the pure word for the state without any period in front of it. And I like that. I'm going to rename that column and call it what it is. It's state. And I'm going to hide this one because I'm not going to use it. I just don't care about it. And guess what? These three columns here, I also don't care about. So I'm just going to hide those. Now this is the most typing I'm going to have to do. Each of these columns is a population for a particular year, a census. So I'm going to go into this and rename the column to be the year that it relates to. And I'm sorry that I can't type faster than this, but this is the speed at which I can do it accurately. So. 2013, name to 2014, and you might guess this is 2015. Now, I could stop here. How many of you understand what measure names and measure values are? Yeah, about a half the room. But that's still a little annoying. What I'd really like this to be is structured like a database would store the data, which would be one column called date and another column called population, it would flip it into a more row orientation. And so what I'm going to do is highlight these columns that I want to pivot, and I'm just going to say pivot. And in one click, it's just restructured that data, and now it looks more like it would be stored in a database. And I'm going to rename this column now and call it year. And I'll rename this one and call it what that is, population. And I basically fixed all the problems with this data without leaving Tableau. And I can check the metadata that I created here by clicking this. I can look at the hidden fields. It's all still there. But the real reason I did that was to be able to do some blending. So these could be any two data source. I mean, any source database with a spreadsheet, right? So it doesn't matter what it is. As long as there's some common dimension that you can blend on, it's sort of like doing a join, but a little less robust. So let me get rid of something I had in here previously. Now, I wasn't thinking ahead when I did this bit of work because if I was thinking ahead, I would have named the fields the same names. And I want to blend on two different dimensions, time and state. And unfortunately, Tableau can't see that there's a connection here because I didn't make sure that they were named the same thing. So I'm going to do this blend the most difficult way by defining it manually. So what I'm going to do here is say, State or province in my data is the same as state 
in the Census Bureau data. And then because I want to make it sensitive to the year, I'm going to say the year in my data is the same as year in the Census Bureau data. And when I lock that in, now those little chain links that are orange up there denote a blend based on those two fields. You'll see a blue check mark next to the, the primary data source, which is my data. And when I drag population into the view, it locks in the secondary data source. And you see that little orange checkbox. And so that's pretty neat. It's acting like a join, sort of like a left outer join if you're a database person. Now, the whole reason I did that was to do a per capita sales calculation. So in, in version 9 of Tableau, they, they enabled this facility called ad hoc calculations where I can just start typing stuff. And so I'm going to do a sum of sales. And I'm not completing the typing. I'm just picking the field I want. And I'm going to divide it by the blended data field called population, and I want to express it all as per 100,000 people, and I just type that in, and it just works, which is pretty neat. Now, District of Columbia is a little bit of an outlier, so I'm going to exclude that for the moment. And you know what? I don't really want to look at population there. I'm just going to drag it to the tooltip so that it appears when I hover over the mark, but it's not cluttering the view. And, you know, I really like this calculation I just did. Let's make it slightly more permanent by dragging it down there. And I'm going to type in a title for the, to name the field. I'm going to call it uh, sales per 100,000, 100K pop. And because I'm a little bit stickly about this, I'm going to define the number format specifically to be a currency with no decimal places because I can. And now, while I'm at it, why don't I just drag my ad hoc calculation down to the color. And because there might be some color buying people in here, I'm going to edit the colors to be a gray scale, not orange, gray. Let's step it so there's more pronounced ranges of values, and then I'm also going to put that calculated value out to the right into the label. And so what you're looking at, let me just recap what I just did, because I did a whole lot of things pretty quickly. I wanted to use Census Bureau data that was poorly formatted with my data like it was in my database. So I just connected to the data, used the data interpreter to clean up structural and data quality problems. Then I did a blend using both year and state to lock in a data blend on those two dimensions. Then I did an ad hoc calculation to normalize population by state for the sales values that I'm expressing. And then the last step was to use color to depict that per capita sales figure and then just to make it clear, I put on the label the same calculation. So, for example, in California is still the biggest selling state, but we're only generating $752 per 100,000 people. And, oh, I forgot, I wanted to filter this per year as well. So I'm going to use year on the filter <coughs> shelf, pick just 2015, you'll watch the numbers will change. So both the per capita calculation and, and the gross number. So now, just 2015, there were $831 per 100,000 people. And if I scroll down the list, way down here, Vermont, $2,745 per 100,000 people. That's why I wanted to do this. I wanted to see a fair comparison of uh, taking population into account for these sales. And so that wasn't that hard to do. If I wasn't explaining it to all of you, I could have done it in five minutes, which is the whole idea, make it fast and easy. And I pre-built a dashboard here, just to show you that this will work when you put it in the dashboard. Let me resize this for the screen resolution we have and reposition these elements a little bit. And let me take this legend, throw it down here. Now what I did was add some actions in this data so that I could filter based on just selecting something like this text table, which changes the year. Or I could pick a specific region, 
and all of those per capita calculations change. So that's pretty cool. I can tell you, five years ago, I could not have done that in under five or six hours, probably. And so th this is why the data interpreter is interesting to me, because the discovery, the ability to use this as a discovery tool to take disparate data and make it work like it's part of your database is really pretty powerful. So that's the use case for this particular product right now, I think, is using it as a proof of concept to build uh, new views with data. It, you know, if, I would use this if I was going to make this a standard report. I would probably make the case, why don't we put this in our database so we don't have to do this blending and, and these ad hoc calculations. Why don't we just start importing the, the uh, annual forecasts of, of the population that the Census Bureau puts out. But it's a great way to, to make discovery on um, new findings that uh, people might not be asking for but become a need. Right, so that's one thing you can do with this. Now let's look at another use case. So the second thing I wanted to talk about is using Tableau for forecasting and discovery. Now Tableau is not a replacement for R or SAS or SPSS or any of these more sophisticated tools. It can work with them, but uh, it does do forecasting in a way that's useful for a lot of people. So are there any salespeople in the room? Because I'm going to pick on salespeople a little bit. Uh, this is sales data, right? And a salesperson might want to know, is the future going to repeat itself in a somewhat consistent way with the last few years in this case? And so what you're looking at with the blue line is actual data. And what's on that? The yellow line with the banding, which is confidence <coughs> intervals, is a forecast. And I'm going to show you how hard it is to build those in Tableau. I'm going to just turn off the forecast. Now, you've been able to do forecasting in Tableau for a while, several years, but you had to remember where to point and right click or what menu to use. And in version 9, Tableau added this analytics button. And so if, if I was someone that knew nothing at all about R or any statistics, I can just pick this up and drag it here and drop it on the thing that says forecast and it generated a forecast. All right. Now, somebody might want to know, what did it do? And so my second answer is, well, to most things in Tableau, if you pointed it and right click, you're going to get a menu option that probably will lead you somewhere. So let's look at what it did. You can expose the forecast options and it doesn't matter what time period you're looking at at Tableau. If you're giving it click stream data and you're looking at seconds, it can use that. It can use minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, whatever the time slice you're looking at. But you have to give it at least nine time periods where it won't generate a forecast. It just won't work. So you can see in this example, it assumed you wanted to look at the next 13 months. And what it will do by default is always ignore the last time period because it assumes it's not the end of the month in this case. That's the basic assumption. It always assumes the latest period is incomplete, so it ignores it. Now, in this case, the data is static. And watch what happens to the view when I change this from 1 to 0. You notice how the, the lines move? Because I'm now including the latest month in the forecast. And now, if you're a bit saucy and you think you can start adapting your own options here, you can decide to make custom assumptions. Tableau gives you some ability to change how the forecast is constructed. Since nobody here is a statistician, I suggest you just go with automatic. Uh, you can turn on or off the confidence intervals. You can widen the bands. The point is, it, it puts a typical set of tools for this sort of forecasting it, within reach of someone that doesn't know anything about statistics. And if you're really, really interested, you can click the blue text down at the bottom and you can go and read the manual to see more about what it's doing. Now, you might have access to a statistician. Maybe you want to get some opinion on whether this is worth anything. You can again point and right click here and you can describe the forecast in a way that a statistician could look at it and tell you whether or not that meant anything useful. There's 
a minute copy to the clipboard here so you can copy it and email it to your statistic friend to get an opinion on whether or not it's useful. And I, I quit making comments about R squared square and, and p-values because I couldn't find a way that didn't upset a statistician in the room. <laughs> By the way, has anybody here heard of a good definition of a p-value? Because I've asked every statistician I've met and they can't get out anything in under a minute. <laughs> And none of it makes sense to me. So I, here's my way of describing it. If it's not within a certain range, it probably has no predictive value at all. All right, now that, that's one way to do discovery is using forecasting. But I think Tableau's real value is what I'll call just data discovery, where you're playing with a data set for the first time. You know, I don't like a client to tell me anything about their data sets. I just want to get access to the data, and what I usually do is get my headphones on and put some pull train on, and I will play with the data set for a couple hours and just build every kind of visualization that the data will do without thinking. And then I'll usually get a beer and come back, and I'll try to look at the data to see what is the story that the data is telling. And I can tell you, I've been to every single Tableau conference since the first one, and a few in Europe. And every great story I've heard at a conference from some customer of Tableau's is always a discovery story like that. And my favorite one is a good friend of mine, a guy named Andy Kriebel, who I met at the first conference. And I started a first user group in the world in Atlanta with Andy and a few people from UPS and and Norfolk Southern. But I love this story because it really points out a lot of qualities of discovery that I think are useful. How many of you are familiar with uh, John Snow and the cholera map, the ghost map? All right, let me give you a short minute on this. It, in uh, the mid-1800s, there was a cholera outbreak in London, and this guy, John Snow, was sort of a precursor epidemiologist, right? And at the time, uh, hundreds of people were dying in a very short period of time in this one part of London. And they thought that it was due to miasma or bad air. And Snow didn't think it was bad air, but he didn't know what it was, and they didn't know what germs were, and they knew nothing about waterborne illness. Uh, and there happened to be a priest in the neighborhood that knew the people very well, and, and somehow he and Snow connected, and they figured out that these pumps, this one particular pump, people living around that pump were dying in volume. Uh, and it wasn't until a year later, well, what they discovered was that, and they capped the pump and people stopped, stopped dying. They didn't know why. They just knew it worked. So they had some theory that something about the pump was the problem. And about a year after the fact, they built a map that's now very famous. A guy wrote a book about it called The Ghost Map. I highly recommend it, but it showed where the deaths occurred. You know, each building near this pump, and there was one really large building where there were no deaths. That turned out to be a brewery. They were <laughs> drinking water there. Uh, so the point is that they didn't understand why, they just knew that it was happening. And they were able to take action to fix it. And Andy had made this, uh, it got a promotion in at this big soft drink company in Atlanta, and he got a job in a big building downtown. And his first day on the job, his boss gave him a data set that had point of sales data for a two liter bottle of this stuff that was being sold in a, not a grocery store, but a, I think it was a drugstore chain, a big one. And after playing with it, not really knowing what he was doing for a few hours, he ended up with a map. And on the map, he had big dots. And some of the big dots were red. And that was bad, because what red meant is it was below a minimum average price that some geniuses at this company had decided that they never needed to go below to, to beat the blue can in the store. But there were lots of examples in certain locations that they were going below this magical number. So he, he went, he didn't know about that. He just went and showed it to his boss. His boss said, this is a big deal. 
you're going on a plane ride tomorrow and showing this to the CEO of that company. And so I won't give you the exact numbers because every year I talk to Andy, the number gets bigger. It's like a fish story. <laughs> <laughs> but what he told me the first time was after about nine months, it generated over $10 million of incremental profit because this company raised prices by a few cents uh, minimums. And that is an astounding payback for two hours worth of work of someone that didn't know what they were looking at. And I think that is the value of discovery. You don't actually have to understand why, but you can identify patterns that if you investigate them further can be very insightful. So this particular view that I'm showing you is a scatter plot, and it's one of my favorite ways to sort of scan data quickly, because I'll run through, uh, you know, in a scatter plot you've got measures on each axis, so you're comparing two different numbers. In this case, you're looking at profit and shipping cost, and you can also with Tableau use color and shape and size to denote other things. So in this case. The uh, shape is uh, order priority and the product category is color. And then I've got some trend lines on here that give you some statistical significance about whether or not these mean anything. And I could cycle through many combinations of numbers on each of those axes and many combinations of dimensions using color, shape, or, or size. And so that's interesting. And at some point I usually get down to analysis where I'm starting to disaggregate the views into small multiples, and now this is when I start really probing what's different. I'm just looking for a line that slopes in a different direction than the other lines. And the nice thing about this is that maybe I want to ask, why is furniture that's critical sloping so negatively? And I can start diving down into this to look at it in more detail, and I can back up to where I was before because Tableau has an unmem uh, unlimited memory for every click, every drop, every drag, as long as I don't end the session. And it's designed to be that way, so that you can bop back and forth without having to remember what you were doing. And I like this tool for doing analysis of a data set I've not looked at before, because it, it usually unearths something that the client didn't ask for that's interesting. And so that you know, I would build a lot of other views here and then I'd start trying to assemble dashboards with combinations of views that try to highlight these differences and point out what's going on. So let's go and look at a dashboard now. So this is all analyst stuff at this point, but now you want to publish this to many more people and let them do their own discovery work. So let me start up another um, dashboard here. And this dashboard I'm going to show you is an example from the, the, the current book. It's, it's literally chapter 8. It's about 100 pages. And I'm obviously not going to detail 100 pages worth of, of notes here. But what I tried to do in this example is show two things. One, best practices for making something understandable. And also best practices for making it scale well when you start putting large data sets. So there's two foundings here. It's easy to make dashboards that are cool looking if you're working with publishing into an iMac with 27 and a half inch retina display and multiple terabytes of SSD and nice clean data sets that behave well. Uh, and also have beautiful screen resolution and fast video cards. But that's just not reality. You know? so, Here's best practice number one. Before you build the dashboard, find out what the worst case scenario is that that thing is going to be consumed in. Because if you don't, it's very likely you're going to be rebuilding it multiple times. Because the, the reality I see, especially in, in, in the larger companies, is that there's always the three-year-old or four-year-old junk that is not much memory, bad video cards, and that is going to become the experience that people complain about. It's also the video resolution you have to consider when you're designing. So, uh, you know, the cost of memory is basically free now. I know you, you may not think that, but if you compare it to what it was 30 years ago, it's free. 
And I, I get into a lot of discussions with database guys saying they don't want to make multiple different dashboard designs because it'll take up a lot of hard disk space. And I'm like, really? You care about the amount of hard disk space? What about the 30 MDX coders in the back room that are costing you a lot of money every month and it adds three to six months to the lead time of every report you make doing it that way? So number one is what is the space? that it's being consumed in. And in this case, I made uh, 800 by 590 pixels the goal. Actually, it was 8 by 600, because that's usually a reasonably old laptop can do that. And because the screen resolution was a little less, I made it 590. So um, that's number one. If you don't do that, you, you're going to have problems, because you'll end up rebuilding them. Now, I'll tell you a story about the hard way that I learned this lesson. I had a client about six years ago that hired me to build about a dozen dashboards. And it was a Russian guy that didn't speak English very well, and he never came to the office. He was always just a box, a voice on a box. <coughs> and I asked the question, what's the worst case scenario for these dashboards? And he really didn't understand the question, and I repeated it, and I said, how much space, and then he didn't understand that, so I said, is this really crappy loner laptop you gave me that's four years old, is that the worst case that this is going to be consumed in? He said, yes. So off I went, built a week's worth of dashboards, and then I gave a presentation to like 90 people in the company, because he loved them, and the next day the Tableau people called me and said, what did you do? We just sold $100,000 worth of licenses, and I was feeling really good about myself. And the following day, I walked into their QC group and showed the dashboards to the people that had to approve them before they were published. And in three minutes, they said, none of these will work. And I'm like, why? Well, they're going to be in a reporting portal, and you have 400 pixels by 500 pixels. So I had to go back to the Russian guy and explain <clears throat> that none of the stuff I built would work, and they all had to be redesigned. And it actually took two more weeks, and he was really not happy with it. But that's when I learned, don't, don't just assume, find out. So that's number one. Number two, if you're going to build dashboards that scale well, you might want to try to avoid using quick filters. And the reason I say this is that the first time I learned this lesson, I had a Tableau salesman call me and say, Dan, can you help me? with a problem I have. I said, what's the problem? He said, I sold an eight core license. I'm like, well, that's not a problem. That sounds like a good thing. And he said, well, but the first dashboard the guy that funded the project got took seven minutes to load. And he hates me and wants his money back. And so I, I ended up getting on the phone with this guy and I said, can you describe what your dashboard looks like? And he said, well, I have, and these aren't the words he used. I'm saving time by giving you my words. I have a text table that's like 80 columns wide and 5,000 rows. And I have a time series chart. OK. And it's on a Teradata database. OK, well, that's not good, but it shouldn't be slow. What else is in there? Do you have anything? Oh, I have some filters. He's a global manager of a global insurance company. And he, had, he wanted to look at the whole world. And I said, well, how many filters? And he said he had to count for a minute. And he told me there were 13 filters. And the problem is some of those filters were scanning dimension tables that had tens of thousands of records. And Tableau has to scan all those tables in order to build the initial view. And we found this out because we realized that there's a folder in Tableau called under my Tableau repository that saves everything, including queries. We thought, oh, well, why don't we build a little thing to strip out the performance data so that we can build a Tableau dashboard of the Tableau dashboard performance and explain it to clients when it's slow. And that was the first client I used this for. And it showed all but 10 seconds of the load time was building the quick filters. And so that's when I started thinking, quick filters are not good at scale. So the other thing that I will tell you is that in general, I think in this size, four data objects works well, because it generally fits. Now, I violated that rule here by another rule, which if you look in the upper right, there's an, a fifth data object, but it takes up about the same amount of space a multi-select filter would take up. 
But instead of using a drop-down filter, I'm using this text table because it shows data and it also works just like a filter. Because if I click this, notice a couple of things happen. First, by clicking, I changed the year. I filtered three of the four views for year. The spark line in the lower right is all 24 months always, so it's unfiltered. So that's a filter action. And then the second filter action here actually exposes a floating data object. This, this is showing the percent mix by region of sales. There's actually a, a thing called the table calculation being used there. And when I remove the filter, two things happen. The floating object disappears. That's just an option on how the object behaves. And uh, it left the last selected filter on for a year. It didn't go back to all years. So uh, it's the same thing as using a quick filter, but it will scale better. And it also adds data in the same amount of space that there would be no data. So I like that. Now, the other thing you'll see here is a limited use of color. I'm, I'm using color two ways in this, and that's about the most I would use in a dashboard. The product type is using the primary use of color here. But over on this side, you'll notice there's this gray and blue. And the idea is it's a sales dashboard for a salesman. And blue means it's below plan. And it's below plan in that text table, which has no scrolling vertically or horizontally, by the way. Now, the other thing you'll see are these tool tips. My, my goal is to build a dashboard that the questions that occur to people are answered when they point at it. So when you hover over a mark, there's more instructions. And it was Edward Tufte that actually said this the first time. He's a dashboard building, he says, put small instructions near the work. So when you hover over something, you can use these tool tips to put instructions in. And uh, I use, in this example, I'm using a, a, a brown italicized print to denote an instruction. So if, especially when Tableau is new, it's good to give people consistent hints. And so you see up here at the top, click headers or marks to highlight related areas. Press escape to remove highlight. It's a nice breadcrumb. If I'm over here, you see select year. That's a hint. If you hover over the tooltip, there's more verbose instructions in the tooltip. Now the other thing is when I click coffee, because blue means under budget, it highlights the related marks in the other related views. So this is building discoverability in for someone that knows nothing about how you design this. And then the other thing is that the next technique I'm going to show you, I learned at that first client that had the seven minute load time. Here's how I solved the problem. I got rid of all the quick filters and I made a dashboard that looked like this but I made six of them that all cascaded to lower levels because he wanted to look at the whole world, he wanted to look at continents, he wanted to look at countries, regions, products, services, and I just made a drill down path that was a series of different dashboards. They, it ended up being six levels. Each one of them loaded in about eight seconds. It took an hour and a half, by the way, to get that. Uh, the guy that built the original horrible dashboard was actually really smart. He just didn't know anything about how Tableau worked. Yes? Just real quick, the thing you did there 30 seconds ago with the coffee where it highlights the other data and yeah. the other object, is that automatic or do you have to program that in? Uh, it's no programming at all. It's called a filter action, and here's how hard it is. If you know that you can click here and click this little crayon, it just built that action. It's called a highlight action. So I, all I did was click the legends, and that's the way I suggest people learn that. Because you can go up into a menu and define that specifically, but it's a little tricky because there's multiple levels of detail in the highlighting. So just click in, the, in there, click the crayon, and then go and look at what Tableau did. You can look up here in the dashboard and look at the actions and see the highlight action. That's what it did. You don't have to know that, though. You can let Tableau teach you how to do that. So I, I highly recommend cheating like that whenever possible. Now, 
How do you make it cascade down to multiple levels? Because in the story I told you, that's how I solved the problem. The eight minute or seven minute dashboard load was eight seconds. Well, I cheated a little bit because if I'd added up all the dashboards, it was really more like 48 seconds. But the first view was the 50,000 foot boss view. And then if you saw something like this, it goes, I'm interested in that. If you click it, oh, there's a four related metrics by market, click on the blue text below. Again, it's color by numbers. So if you click on the blue text, you're actually going to go to another place. And then when I'm in the other place, a couple of things happen. So notice on the top here, in the title, it passed the variables that I had selected. I was pointing at the product type coffee. I was pointing at product Colombian. And I had already filtered that first dashboard for 2013. It passed those variables, and I'm displaying them in the header. A lot of beginners in Tableau, when I see them build this, they would put product type, product, and year into the actual text table, which creates a lot of wasted white space. So if you use filtering intelligently and titling, you can make it a nice, no horizontal, no vertical scrolling view of just the numbers that are pertinent. And then the use of color here, the blue means under budget. Now, the other thing that happened that I didn't really uh, talk about earlier is the use case for this is it's coffee data. I'm a little coffee distributor. I want to compare my pricing for coffee in Colombia to what Amazon charges for coffee in Colombia. And so what I used was a URL action. And down here, this is actually a live Amazon website for coffee in Colombia. And you'll notice those two variables got passed as a string to an embed of the Amazon website. Now, I didn't write one line of code to do that. I just pulled this object over here, the web page, dropped it in there, and I created an action called the URL action. So here's how I did it. I went to the Amazon website. I typed in a search for coffee, comma, Columbia, and I pressed enter. Then I copied the script in the browser window opened up the dialog box for a URL action, pasted that script in, and then I looked for the literal string and the word coffee. And I inserted a variable called product type from my data and replaced that, that, that literal string with a Tableau variable. And then I did the same thing with the product. And it looks like something that you've spent a lot of time on. And I've used this technique for embedding you know, live Google uh, Google Maps and other web apps that you can pass your data to and it really looks great. Now, I repeated this cascading in that first that thing I talked about multiple times. And when you do that, you have to put some kind of breadcrumb in here. I just made a dumb text table to hold a filter action that when I click, takes me back to the place I want them to go. And I put instructions in there. Click this to go home. So I try to make it easy for people to understand what they're doing. The point of this is that if you do it this way, what I've found is that it becomes accessible to someone that doesn't know anything about Tableau and doesn't even have to know necessarily anything about the business. If you use tooltips effectively, if you explain it, you know, for example, if there was a very complicated calculation, I might put in there, Joe, smart person at your company, gave me this really uh, complex formula. Here it is, and here's the guy's phone number and his you know, email address. Don't call me. I'll bill you. <laughs> but I try to make all the questions that I know the old guy with glasses or the old person that has probably been burned by the young, really smart person that made a whole bunch of nice dashboards that they later found out were completely wrong. This is why they always want to see the numbers. And I say, you don't need all the numbers. You need the numbers that are pertinent to what you're looking at. So I put them in. I try to think about how, what questions are going to occur to that person when they look at it. And if there was some more explanation that I need to put in there, that's what I do. All right, so now I'm going to go one step beyond this. Because somebody had to build that, and somebody had to know what the end goal was. 
But let's just assume that you're really lucky and you have a big budget and you can go and hire smart data scientists from one of the 490 schools that offers the degree now. And they build some really elaborate forecasting model using R. Right? This is an example of how you could use Tableau and Amazon Web Services and other open source tools to operationalize more complicated things. So the particular example I'm going to show you is a live web demonstration that we built. And here's the use case, all right? So let's just assume smart data scientists created something in R on an R server, and they have determined that these variables are okay for people to play with. And so I'm, what you're looking at here is a Python Flask web application. I'm just going to change a couple of variables just to show you that if you change something, it will happen, and I'm going to click the button. It'll give you a warning saying this might take a while. And what it's going to do, I don't think that took, yeah, it did take. It's going to go out now, and it's sending those variables to this R instance. R is going to create a result set, publish it to a Postgres database that's also writing on Amazon Web Services. Then Tableau looked at, was pointed at it. A dashboard was created, and the dashboard was published using Tableau server to a web embed, which is this website. And so the neat thing about that is that this is a much more complicated model for forecasting because it's R. And because it's also Tableau, I can do things like, oh, I'm the boss. I want to run to a meeting with a PDF of this picture. So I just click that, and now I'm going to get a PDF. Or maybe I'm lucky. And I actually do understand a little bit about both R and Tableau, and, and the admin has allowed me to edit the workbook in Tableau server. And so if permissions were granted to do this, I've just opened up this, and they can actually design their own views now from a web browser. So it's Tableau. The point is, is that now we're allowing forecasting for the masses using much more sophisticated techniques that Tableau can do because Tableau connects to 57 different data products now in Windows and something like 27 or 28 in uh, OS 10, you can get a lot of utility out of linking Tableau with a lot of these different tools. All right, so that, that's a more complicated setup, but for the end user, it's simple. Let me go back to my deck here. I've got a few things I want to point out before I start answering questions. So, you know, one way I think about this when you think about all the things we just talked about is that bigness is not a challenge, all right? We fix that. We can handle lots of data. We have data products that can deal with lots of different data problems and do it quickly. But variety is still a pretty big challenge because every month, I think I, when I looked at the data uh, just yesterday, there were 305 different data project products mentioned in that dashboard. Three months ago, there were 289. That's just in three months. That's how many new commercial or open source databases have been mentioned somewhere in social media. And so this variety issue is a challenge, and tools like Tableau that help you bridge these different data sources are useful. Um, and I also talked about the three kinds of data, the data you know, which are reports, the data that you know you need to know more about, which are usually questions that are derived from the reports. Traditional stack tools do a pretty good job of those two. But the third kind of data, which is the data you didn't know you needed to know more about, I think Tableau is uniquely capable of dealing with that in a way that's accessible to a lot of people. And then if you're in the early excitement stage of Tableau and you're trying to justify to the head, the CIO of your company why that person needs to buy yet another tool, the metaphor you could use is the railroad track and the helicopter. Yes, you, you've invested in the railroad track and you are not going to throw it out. You just won't. But the helicopter is useful. I don't know many big cities that don't have traffic copters now reporting on traffic 
and accidents every day. And that's how I think at Tableau. It's the, the copter that zooms around and gets you the information that you didn't know you were going to need. It's dynamic. I, I want to, sorry this is the self-serving plug in my speech. <laughs> Why would you want a book on Tableau because it's an easy product? Well, I wrote the book that I wanted when I started using Tableau in 2007 because nothing was documented. And then I wrote a revised edition of it, which is out about two months now, because every year Tableau adds so much new to the product, within a year and a half I realized my first edition was outdated. And I thought, this will be pretty easy, I'll just do this in a couple of months. And it took me 1,200 hours <laughs> and nine months, and that was just my time. I think four other or five other people spent another two to 300 hours. And so now it's a, it was a 500-page book in the first edition. Now it's a 700-page book because Tableau added that many new things. So it's virtually a new book. It's about 80% new material. Uh, there are 550 images, 61 workbooks that make up all the examples in the book. And it's really designed for two kinds of people. One, I've never used Tableau before. I want to open it in page one and read page 700 and learn about all of the stuff I need to know, both in desktop and server. And it does that. There's a second person, though, that I've been using Tableau for a year or so. I'm pretty good, but I feel stagnated. I don't know how to do things in two clicks that are possible to do. It takes me 12. So there's shortcuts, there's tricks, there's things not to do that I learned by doing it wrong at least once in there. And that's probably the reason to buy a book. And if you like books, it's nice to have one on your desk. There's a 100-page function reference with code samples alphabetically sorted. That's the other thing I wanted. Because I use a lot of functions all the time, but there's ones that I use once a year or never. And I want to look it up and see the syntax so that I can figure out what I'm supposed to do. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we think of this at InnerWorks. Data visualization is critical always because people that aren't statisticians and data people don't understand it until you can visualize it and tell a story. The problem here is different companies all have really great expertise in a lot of these areas, but almost no one has them in all of the areas, and that's sort of how we set up the practices. Do you need hardware, network infrastructure? Do you need uh, you know, ETL logic for data quality issues? Everybody's got those. Or all your data is perfect, right? <laughs> data governance is a concern. Some of you have legal reasons to have to care about it. Others are just business competitive and you don't want it getting out. Training is important and, and it's counterintuitive in the Tableau world because it's simple, but some of the worst dashboards I've seen built are always built by the most experienced BI experts. Why? Because they build what it looks familiar. And they build it in a way that's useful for the legacy tools. And so I think it's the most important element of doing a tool like this is the most experienced people need the training. It's much easier to train someone that knows nothing about the old tools and nothing about databases to use Tableau because they don't have the baggage. But once you see it, you'll understand how you've got to structure your data differently and how it works. And then, of course, um, the discovery aspect, people need to be shown some examples of that, which is helpful. And the end goal is to get to the point where anybody can create reports quickly and report backlogs go away. And that's sort of the goal of why how InterWorks thinks of you know, service and clients. This is my contact information. I will have all of the stuff that I showed you up on a website in about a day or two. So if there's something interesting to you here, you can download the deck, and all of the workbook examples will be completed and out there that you can download. So does anyone have any questions? Because there were a couple people halfway raising their hands. Oh, there's lots. OK, let's go. Yeah, I was wondering, do you have any uh, like video tutorials on YouTube, or if you don't, if, are there any you might Yes. I, the InterWorks blog has a about, I don't know, 1,500 blog posts now, Johnny. We have videos. Tableau has a really good video library of, you know, five-minute long videos for specific technique. And there's 
lots of consulting companies out there doing things with Tableau now that I'm sure have video content. Ours is pretty good. We have about uh, 80 people doing Tableau projects every week. And so they've learned a lot. Who's next? Yeah. yeah um, when using custom SQL to bring in, say, uh, data from like SQL Server, and um, using like a CTE or a uh, CAD table, you cannot bring in data like this into Tableau. So what is the best way to bring in data without creating uh, I'm going to table that because we need to talk about that afterwards. <laughs> okay. I think that you can do all kinds of hacking in the connection, but my, my antenna always go up when I hear about that because to me it sounds like the database isn't right. <laughs> so I tend to think about why are you having to go through that pain. So yeah, you can hack connection scripts and you can do things. Let's talk about that on the side though, because it's some very specific problem. Yes. Yeah, um, on the kind of soft skills side, I'm really curious to, about the conversation that you had with the seven-minute client. Um, when you, so you oh, moved when them from that into a six-level drill down, how did you sort of dialogue with them to get from their problem to your solution? Well, it really wasn't like that. The boss guy was angry, and he was probably a seven-figure guy. And so he wanted it fixed, and he just said, you will come to our office next week. And I said, okay, but I want to be with the guy that built this dashboard. Because he knew the data, he just didn't understand Tableau. Uh, and so I just explained to him more or less those concepts, but the first thing I did was say, let me run this little tool on your laptop, because we had built, uh, there's, a, there's a thing in Tableau called the performance recorder, it's under the help menu. It actually is a copy job of something we built about seven years ago that I showed to Mark Reeder, who's one of the first probably 10 employees at Tableau. I showed him our tool in Barcelona. He said, this is cool. We should have built this. And what Tableau did was actually make their log file even better. Right? So what's in there is the same thing, basically, that, we, that I used to show this guy what was wrong. And I just ran that performance recording, which generated a dashboard of the longest queries running, and it was all queries that related to the quick filters. And I said, we need to get rid of all those. He goes, but, but he wants all of them. I said, we'll do it all visually. And so we just looked at the data and built five or six dashboards. Really, it only took, it, to build the first one and getting it loaded in eight seconds was about 90 minutes to get there. We walked into his boss and he was really, really happy and he said, how long to do all the rest of it? He said, we'll have it done by the end of the day. And we did. And so that guy was really happy and so was the Tableau salesman <laughs> because the customer didn't hate him anymore. But it really was that simple. The guy knew the data inside and out. He knew legacy tools. He knew the database. I just had to show him how Tableau worked and what not to do. And, you know, they had a good database, but the data was massive. So that you can be sloppy when the data is small. By the way, all the best practices I told you, violate them all you want if it works. But if it starts to get slow or people don't understand, that's how I think of it. I use them as my default, but I change all the time because I can't anticipate the number of different ways humans will think of using data. Or, yes? Um, question about your um, dashboard design. I noticed that you don't have any white space around your individual panels in yeah. the, the dashboard. And to me, I look at that and they're all running together. Yeah, it's a fair, uh, fair criticism. I had a tiny space. I made a difficult job. I wanted to fit it in 800 by 600 pixels and I had to tell a story. So the, this, in chapter eight of the book, it's sort of like, this is not an easy thing to do, to fit all this. Uh, so I agree, if you had more space, you'd probably put some divisions in there so you could more clearly see the different pieces of each data object. And you can do things in Tableau with color and shading and boxing to uh, you know, divide those spaces. I just didn't put it in this example because it was meant to be a, this is not easy to fit all this in 800 by 600 pixels. So how could you do it? But that's a fair criticism. Yeah, I was, I was just checking to see if there was like this best practices I wasn't aware of. Or yeah. I tend to not put anything 
I don't put ink on a dashboard that's not data ink. But I do insert slightly grayed areas between data objects sometimes so that it doesn't confuse people, so they see the definite uh, definition. I just didn't use that in this particular example. Good question. Thank you. Yes? Uh, the data in the product that you showed, is that part of the tool or something like that? I did not hear the first the data half. Interpreter. The data interpreter is just part of version uh, 9 on. It's better in 9.3. It will be even better in 10.0, which should come out in the summer. I didn't show you things like being able to do unions uh, on bunches of files that are just junk off the web. That's kind of a neat facility that you can do as well. Yeah? Well, the new, it sounds like there's many new versions. Does Tableau give you those upgrades for free, or do you yes. have to keep paying? You, 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 part of the license is uh, software, and then there's a maintenance that's 20% of the software. It's definitely worth it. I've been using Tableau since 2007, version 3, and we're on version 9.3 now. They do usually a major release every 12 to 15 months and a dot release every 3 to 4 months, and they add features. They make it scale better. They make more tools, more visual styles, easier to use, so it's definitely worth it. Yes? Speaking of other uh, functionality, what experiences would someone need before they're ready to get certified? Is that the, the certified? Yeah, the uh, associate level certification. Okay. The experiences you need is go and get a Tableau training, right? Because are you a database expert? No. Good. So you're a spreadsheet person? Yeah, you'll probably learn Tableau very easily, and your challenges will be understanding why databases store things in the way they do. Uh, so you might want to read a book or two from Ralph Kimball uh, on database schema uh, just to understand that a little better. But learning Tableau is not difficult. If you have spreadsheets of unbroken lists of data and you point Tableau at them, you can start building things within an hour. If you go to uh, public training, they have fundamentals and advanced training, uh, and they're good classes. They're worth, they're worth going to. <coughs> yes? You can mention about data discovery, right? Uh, is, are there uh, best practices which you cover in the book? For di discovery? Yeah. Yes, I talk about, but this is a soft skill now. This isn't um, hard science. But my way of doing it, and I think it's, it, I, it works for me, and I think it could work for anyone. I don't think about too much about the data. I look at what's possible to build with that data set, and I just build every view as fast as I can. And in, in a couple hours, I can usually build 50 to, to, to 100 views, and then I let it rest for a few minutes, and I come back and start assembling related data in a dashboard, and then I start enabling filter actions. Because that's when you can start seeing patterns and outliers that are interesting. I mean, I, I sold, I've sold two licenses in really odd circumstances. Once was on a plane, because if I get upgraded to business class, I am going to pull out a cool dashboard and play with it. <laughs> because this actually happened, uh, I was flying from Seattle to Oakland, and I got upgraded. And there was a lady sitting next to me, and I, was, I got my laptop open and started building uh, some stuff. And she was staring at it, and I just turned my laptop. I said, would you like to see how I did that? And it turned out this lady was a, a, worked for a consumer product company that was massive. And she started complaining to me about this OB thing they were doing at the corporate office that they'd been working on two years and she still wasn't getting any data from it. And I said, well, what do you get? She goes, spreadsheets. And I'm like, can I see one? She goes, well, I can't. It's under, it, you, we'd have to have an NDA. And for some reason I had an NDA <laughs> in my bag. I literally had one and I went, <laughs> sign here. And, and then she showed me the dashboard and it was a perfect unbroken list of point of sale data, like a half a million records. It was perfect. And I said, I will build you a dashboard before we land in Oakland. <laughs> and I did. And that lady bought licenses the next week. Uh, and so uh, I've, I've done demos for clients 
without ever touching a computer. I just walk in and say, download the software. Do you know where the data is? And I just start saying, what do you want to look at? And then uh, I tell them to drag fields to the right places. I did this with one of our first clients, a company called Noonan Utilities, that wanted to look at call data. So it's call data. It's perfect. And they were about to spend like $100,000 on some ridiculous phone company product that was way overpriced. And the data was stored in a SQL <coughs> Server database from a phone system. And so I went in and I didn't even bring a laptop. I just, I knew the guy that worked there because I used to work with him. I said, just go to this website and download the software. All right, what do you want to see? He knew how to get, he had the security to get in the database. He said, we want to see what day or week most help desk calls come in. I said, okay, drag this pill here, drag that there. And everyone in the room moved like two feet closer to the screen. And in about 45 minutes, they'd forgotten it was a sales call. Because they just asked a bunch of questions and I just kept telling them where to drag things. And they bought, I don't know, $10,000 worth of licenses the next week. And I didn't even open my laptop. They did their own demo. I just told them where to drop things in the view. So it's incredibly powerful it, and it's empowering when people can do that. They're not used to that, when they can look at a picture. Because how many of you have built something for your boss that you thought was exactly what they asked for, and then you show it to them and they go, oh, this is good, but could you do this? Because they don't realize what it is they want until they see it first. And in this tool, you can just iterate that right on the spot. In other tools, I mean, 20 years ago, I, that was three weeks of work. You know, when I was like 25, I thought I was smarter, smarter than my boss, and I didn't have to listen to what he or she was asking. I just build it, and then I'd show it to them, and then they'd tell me all the stuff that I didn't put in. And, and it was hard work, but now you can just iterate this stuff. Anyway, that was a really long question. I got answer to your question, but I like that question. <laughs> Any others? I will stay here to answer questions for a while for odd things. I'm not the best guy in the room to answer that specific question. The guy with the blue on down there. Is... Yes? Okay, I'll, I'll give you a counter example. I work for the large company and yeah, you come in and sell the sexiest thing in the world and you can, you can find some great discovery that really makes it into the business. But after that license is sold, now that has to be under IT control with governance. Oh, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. And I can tell you, it, it never was that way before, because before version 6, Tableau couldn't scale, didn't have any data governance, and I avoided IT people like the play. But I could sell it to a salesperson and a marketing person and a logistics person at the desktop level. And my advice to people is don't try to sell a home run. I'll use the baseball metaphor. Do, the, do a bunch of singles and don't talk too much about it. Just get a license. That, what Tableau's whole marketing plan was, we're going to make this inexpensive so an individual can buy it on their, on their little credit card with the company and not tell anyone. And they fan that flame for five years. And so a lot of the, the, the projects we do start out very small. They're just help somebody do something really interesting. And then when you get something interesting, show it to the boss, and they will get it. If you show them something they didn't think to ask for that's insightful and actionable, they'll start asking questions about, how did you do that? I know where you are. <laughs> and I love baseball because there's just tons of data in baseball. <laughs> but um, I, look, you know how I found Tableau? My boss came to me in 2006 and said, I think we need a new ERP system. And I said, why? Well, my reports don't look the same. In Europe and Asia and North America, they're all a little different. I think we just need to re-engineer everything and do it. And I thought that was a terrible idea because we've just gotten through rolling up an industry and then divesting half of it. And so we would have lost another 20% of the good people. And I thought a data warehouse will solve the problem because I'd ridden on a plane next to a guy with one of the big three stack providers. 
and I got a quote for like a million dollars and he said, nine to 12 months and I need a 20% down payment, trust me, you'll love it. And I'm not that trusting. I was a CIO and a CFO, so I could argue with myself over the budget. <laughs> but uh, I, by pure dumb luck, found Tableau, and I actually built the solution in a way that's slightly cheating in a weekend. I literally started on a Friday with a free trial license and went into his office on Tuesday and said, how do you like this, Brian? He said, first, this is amazing. How did you do that? And second, I didn't authorize you to spend any money. How much did it cost? And I said, nothing. I do want you to buy me and my wife two dinners because I worked on it all weekend. And he thought that was a pretty good deal. <laughs> now, six months later, we had built a whole database and uh, scaled it up to five years of atomic level data. The first versions were one year of atomic level data because we were a capital equipment company. I could fit literally a year's worth of atomic data in a single tab in an Excel spreadsheet. It just happened to fit my need at the time. But it literally was that. It was a week. And then I hired a company called Innerworks to build the database that I designed in a, a real database. And I had documented the ETL logic over a six month period and gave that same guy, a guy named Brian Bickle, that, and he built the whole thing in a week. And the total rollout was three weeks, and that was a 10% of the cost of what I was about to spend on a traditional stack solution. And I quit my job about six months later and became a consultant because I thought everybody's going to need this, they just don't know it yet. I better stop talking. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much for your Big hand for Dan. Any links to slides or images and all that said to me, I will post those on the event on Meetup so you guys can see that. If you want to throw up real quick? I've got, I've got What's the hashtag? It's hashtag TYD2, Tableau Your Data 2. Just tweet something about, and if you're here to answer nice questions, it might go up. Yep. <laughs> You'll be here to answer questions. If you haven't joined the group, please join the group. And post comments if you enjoyed the talk. Um, just would like to see that. And come look at what John over here has drawn as the visual notes from Dan's talk. Thanks for coming out.